Well, I want to welcome everybody as we start virtually entering the room. This is the third in our series that we call A Decade of U.S. Cyber Strategy. It's a series of chats where we meet with uh, practitioners and scholars to discuss the development of U.S. cyber strategy, especially in regarding, uh, regarding the Department of Defense over the last decade. Now, it's based on a, a co-edited volume, which I have here, uh, which is called 10 Years In. And this is the um, Implementing Strategic Approaches to Cyberspace. This is a co-edited volume um, between um, members of US Cyber Command, um, as well as members of academia. Um, and so I, I really um, suggest that if you're interested, um, this book is actually able to be downloaded on um, the Naval War College site. And where you registered, you should see a link there. Um, so that's one of the benefits of publishing with government presses is uh, the public does not have to pay for them. So please feel free to download and enjoy. I know this is a really exciting uh, week for me because this is a week that we're gonna talk about cyberspace and warfare. Now, I think a lot of times when there is a public discussion about, especially cyber strategy, we gloss over warfare and that is I think that doesn't do service to the amount of um, innovation and thinking that's been happening over the last decade about how you integrate cyber operations in warfare, about how you plan for it, how you organize for it, how you man and equip for it. Um, and today we have with us an extraordinary uh, group of panelists who have really been living the execution of cyber strategy uh, in warfare, um, really kind of over the last decade. So I'm going to introduce very quickly um, my panelists. So start with uh, Dr. Josh Rovner, who is an associate professor at American University. He also spent a year at Cyber Command as a scholar in residence. We have with us um, retired Vice Admiral T.J. White, who was the commander of 10th Fleet, also that's also called, well, also U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, and then former commander of CNMF, which is the Cyber National Mission Forces. And y'all, I'm going to try not to throw out too many acronyms, but this is going to be a DOD heavy panel, so I, I will try. We are going to come back to what CNMF and really is, so just hang with us for a second. Uh, we have um, Aaron Hughes. Aaron Hughes was the former um, DASD for cyber policy um, and actually was the DASD of cyber policy when the 2015 cyber strategy was released. And um, so he is one of the formative members that kind of developed what the cyberspace operations and warfare. He's currently the vice president and CISO for Albertsons and uh, was my reserve commander up until a few weeks ago at U.S. Cyber Command. Um, and finally, we have with us Lieutenant General Tim Hawk, um, who is coming from the beautiful city of San Antonio, Texas, my hometown. He is the commander of 16th Air Force and also a former commander of the Cyber National Mission Forces. Um, I, I have stacked the deck, so we have more Air Force than Navy and no Army. Um, so this will be an Air Force heavy discussion. So I want to start by, by leveling, getting a little leveling information out there because um, I think we can get wonky pretty fast when we start talking about cyber operations and warfare. And I want to start with um, really what the cyber mission force is. Um, so we'll start with Aaron. Aaron, can you explain kind of in 2015, what were you guys thinking about what the cyber mission force was going to be and what their purpose was going to be. And then I want to turn to the two subsequent commanders to, um, to really get your view on how you implemented it and built this new force. So Aaron. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Jackie, thanks for the invitations. Great to uh, connect with Admiral White, General Hawk, uh, and Dr. Rovner here this morning. Uh, great topic, great panel, and excited to join. Um, well, first, let me say that the the Cyber Mission Force was sort of formulated, developed, constructed in advance of the, the 2015 strategy, right? We can go back to um, the incubation of uh, various um, uh, uh, JTFs and, uh, and, and previous, previous constructs, but tactically, it was a way for DOD to organize, you know, defend and fight in cyberspace 
tactically 6,300 members split between various different teams. And in the 2015 strategy, we started to articulate the position of, you know, how we would defend the nation. What would our, the, you know, partnerships with industry be? How would we, you know, organize to execute protection missions or offensive missions? Um, and sort of the construct of, of, of CMF was around sort of, you know, the numbers of teams, the types of skill sets, you know, where we would pull in, um, you know, different capabilities from the various services. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been great to see it evolve uh, uh, over the last, you know, five to, to seven years. And I hope we get into some of the conversations of what lessons learned we learned, we had very early on around, hey, do we, do we really need, you know, 35 on net operators to uh, be parts of a team? I think there's a bunch of, of lessons uh, and uh, uh, lessons learned over the past couple of years that I hope we get into. But yeah, very broadly a way for us to, to organize, defend and, and fight in cyberspace and leverage the capabilities of the services. Well, I'm all right, you were one of the, the first commanders. Uh, I think you were the second, maybe, maybe Nakasone came first, um, but I, uh, I would be really, oh, did I miss, did I? Oh, I just, I, I just wanna make sure we, because I know we can get caught up in acronym soup. Right, and then I, I was very much a, uh, uh, guilty of this. Cyber Mission Force, everything. Cyber National Mission Force, of which General Hawk and Admiral White were the commander of, is a subset of that, as you handed off to Admiral White there. Yeah, that is really important. I think actually that gets confused a lot in the public conversation. Uh, that extra in is really important. Um, so I'm all right. I would love to hear kind of your perspective about those first few years, building it out, your challenges, um, and then moving to General Hawk as he, because he, um, uh, you know, he took the reins from you and kind of where we evolved. Yeah, so as Tim is fond of telling me, he had to fix all the stuff that I didn't get quite right. Uh, just to be clear, and as the matter of the record, so uh, then U.S. Army Major General uh, George Franz was the establishment or the commissioning commander. Uh, he was uh, the first guy, and then uh, he was relieved by uh, General Nakasone, uh, and then me, and then now uh, Tim Hawk, and then I think the current commander is uh, General Joe Hartman. So the Cyber National Mission Force, by design, was a subset of what is what uh, Aaron talked about as the Cyber Mission Force. Uh, the Cyber Mission Force, again, is that little more than 6,000 identified billets that the services generate, the standard sort of service presentation model, just like uh, Tim's Air Force does uh, with their wings and squadrons, like the Navy does with uh, ships and submarines and so on. Um, the cyber uh, mission force broadly uh, is those forces that are directly under the uh, operational control and combatant command of U.S. Cyber Command. And so they are responsible for doing all the operate, the defend, and the full spectrum cyberspace operations. Within the Department of Defense, I think there's a, a couple of other larger sets. The largest set is probably the DOD's cyber workforce which would be a composite of, uh, of everyone that's in the cyber domain uh, from operators and defenders and, and those that do contracting and acquisition and architectural design across the expanse uh, of the DOD and all the services. A subset of that might be the cyber operations force, which would be bigger than the cyber mission force. And that would be where a lot of the service retained capability uh, for example, operating the network infrastructure and defending that infrastructure uh, like Tim does for the Global Air Force mission or the Navy's uh, presence around the globe uh, and so on. Uh, and then the smaller subset would be the Cyber National Mission Force, which uh, I think when I left it three years and change ago was a little under 2,000 folks, uh, about 38 or 39 teams of a composite cadre. Unique discriminator uh, in a positive sense in my mind about the Cyber National Mission Force that it was built by design from the ground up to be fully joint. Uh, so uh, probably the easiest and best uh, aggregation of uniformed civilian contractor, active duty and reserve cadre. Uh, and then I think, uh, um, you know, moved from you know, what we were going to do in the context of defending broadly DOD infrastructure to becoming more of a defend the nation uh, enterprise. And so 
I think that's why I left it, Tim, over to you for clarifying thoughts. So, so I, I, I will correct one part of the record, which is I did greatly benefit, you know, from, and, and I think the context of both Aaron and, 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 and TJ, what they provided was how we were building the force, building our strategy. And then when I arrived in the Cyber National Mission Force, I benefited from both because then what we really got to was an alignment of, of, of really how Congress viewed offensive and defense cyberspace operations. We started to see alignment and then with our policy and then with our authorities became really now aligned. And, and for us, it was in the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act where Congress really explicitly gave the Secretary of Defense an expectation to conduct offensive cyberspace operations and also identified cyberspace as, as a domain of traditional military activity. And that was very significant in our evolution, which then it normalized how the Department of Defense could view cyber warfare and where it fit in our overall national strategy. And then because of the direction from the Secretary of Defense to General Noxoni to begin to, to take on election defense as an enduring mission of the Department of Defense, those alignment, that alignment of the urgency of the defense, the elections with the changes in the law now allowed us to operationalize the DOD strategy and the work that had gone to build our force and employ it in partnership with DHS and FBI to defend the election. So I think all these things are a part of the journey from the building of the force to then where do we fit in the overall department strategy to now the really the role of cyberspace in any activity we talk about, whether that be for our economy, our national defense, uh, or our strategy. It's, it's very central to every one of those discussions, but really built on the back of that hard work that went on from 2010 forward to put us in the position we're in today. So I think um, this idea of defending the nation and that N in the CNMF is a really, really important distinction um, that separates this force from a lot of other capabilities and ways that we organize within the Department of Defense. So oftentimes when, I mean, these acronyms that the DOD builds, sometimes they're, you know, kind of cute and funny, like the Jedi, you know, or, or but sometimes they are indicating something really important of how the Department of Defense views the threats that they're facing in the nation um, and what role the Department of Defense plays in national security. Um, I think CNMF also represents something about kind of an evolution in how the Department of Defense viewed the role of cyber operations and conflict. Um, and competition prior to conflict. So I think that ties really nicely into Josh's chapter, which um, all of these chapters are really phenomenal and I really recommend everyone reads them. But Josh, you um, really outline a kind of a perspective on um, both the evolution of how we've thought about cyber operations and war and, and a bit of kind of where we should be going. So um, I wanna get to you to, to understand kind of what do you see as the role of cyber operations in national security and especially in, in defense and the US, the role of the Department of Defense? Thanks, Jackie. Well, I, I think the question really depends on whether or not you're talking about peacetime or wartime, um, because there's two different kinds of competition going on. In, in peacetime, um, from my perspective, most of what's going on in terms of cyberspace competition is an intelligence contest which is a fight over information and an attempt to steal information, to protect information, and sometimes to corrupt information. Right? And one of the, the, the issues that, that we're having is um, division of labor, right? And how you bring in um, a combatant command and DOD broadly in what it, it conceptually is basically an intelligence issue. Right? So that, that's the, I think it's an open question in terms of peacetime competition of how all of these moving pieces are going to work together. Now, when you get to an actual shooting war, then you have a, a different set of issues, right? And, and the, the focus of my chapter in the volume is, well, how do we think about cyber, uh, cyber operations in the service of a shooting war? Well, in that case, 
um, I think that the rules of the commander are much clearer, right? I think principally, principally the role of, of, of uh, the command is preserving US advantages. The US has a, a tremendous amount of military advantages, but they all ultimately rely on our ability to communicate internally. And if we can preserve the ability to commute, communicate internally and with forces in, in deployed in a conflict, then our advantages will sustain, right? So it, 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 it's a critical role of not only being able to protect communications, but to organize a number of different forces in what are hypothetically and potentially pretty elaborate campaigns, right? If we can do that, we'll, we'll be fine. The other role or the other purpose of, of cyber operations would be more offensive in a conflict. The idea that you can use offensive um, cyberspace operations to kind of turn up the fog machine for, for, for the other side, to inhibit their communications, to complicate their intelligence picture, to make it hard for adversaries to organize a coherent defense, right? And there are, you know, it, it, in theory, there's a way that you could do that through cyberspace, though it's really, really hard. Right? If you get into a war, you have to presume that the other side will already be hardening communications and making them redundant, which will make it difficult to use cyber for offensive purposes. So my view is in the event of a war, uh, the fundamental uh, thing to do will be to protect your own information and to protect your own communications. If you can get also an offensive advantage, that's great, but I think less, uh, less essential. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push you a little bit more on some things that I know that did not show up in your chapter, but I'll, I'll wait till you have more time to explain the nuance behind your answers. <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, to, to, going off what Josh is talking about, about warfare and then coming back to the organization of the CNMF. Um, I'm going write your chapter in this book is about joint and you brought up joint in your um, conversation, but you are a Navy um, Admiral and General Hawk is an Air Force commander and he, even um, Aaron Hughes civilian has an Air Force background. What do you think is the the role or the difference between the role of the services in cyberspace and warfare and the role of the joint force or the CNMF or kind of cyber command writ large. Like what is the distinction between what these organizations are doing or should be doing? Um, and I think it brings up the inevitable question of, well, as cyber looks more and more joint, should it just be space force? So I don't know uh, who wants to jump first on um, on the service grenade. So I, I can talk a little bit to the from from I think where we bring service strengths and and I think we see it right now. It's the part of the maturation U.S. Cyber Command is is also in how we have evolved in the ability to do supported and supporting just like you would in any other element of warfare, where we can each align across behind one of the component commanders that's executing General Noxoni's guidance. And then we bring together every, the strengths of all of our components to support that commander. And in each case, I think you'll see in, in individual service strengths. You know, from our standpoint as airmen, I think we're really proud of the fact that we really start our thought at the operational level of war in terms of how we approach command and control and how we think about problems and we think about partnerships. And when we when I deal with our counterparts in, in fleet cyber with, with, with Admiral White and now with uh, Admiral Myers, you know, the focus on the fleet and what the fleet does as an element that can also bring capability and, and uh, placement is a different part of our discussion. And then certainly the partnerships that we get through the Army in terms of, of physical ground is just unique to, to each service as to what we're bringing. And, and I think as we've matured as U.S. Cyber Command, and as General Noxoni has also increased in his acquisition authority, those linkages start earlier and earlier in the investment strategy. So we're starting to see that realized, um, and there are a number of really strong strengths between what each service is doing. Hey, Jackie, I'm back. I, I think I understood a little bit uh, a, a little bit of your question and then Tim's answer, maybe in terms of some strengths or differences between service cultures and then building the joint force, if I have it right. 
Um, look, I'm a, I'm a big fan at the end of the day that the Cyber National Mission Force is about as completely, fundamentally, absolutely joint uh, as, it, as it ought to be and could be and should be. And that is a very unique strength. Um, you know, Tim has had an opportunity to be a joint force commander there. He's also now also a joint force commander uh, as a joint force headquarters. One of the conversations we've had for a couple of years is how do we make those headquarters elements less service colored and more joint? I think that will ultimately benefit. I do think though that there are some service cultures that benefit, right? So as I take a look at uh, you know, the Marines, a sense of indomitability, and I love that. Uh, I think about the Air Force and uh, I've learned an awful lot about sort of their three plus decades in getting something called the AOC, real, credible, repeatable, sustainable, uh, deployable and, and they deliver. And they have this amazing ability to balance all of the support of commanders wants and needs. So at any given day in the campaign, the needs are being met and then spare capacity is about alignment towards wants. Uh, and over the course of the campaign, the mission and the campaign is successful. Uh, you know, the Navy brings its own culture, which I think, you know, of course I'm a fan of is sort of independent minded in a sense of being, you know, forward and, and in, have to be to a degree uh, independent uh, in action uh, and sustainment, although you can't do it alone. And then of course the army, I think, um, you know, just their ability to think from sort of principled maneuver warfare doctrine all the way through, su through sustainable campaign. I do think though um, <clears throat> that uh, the work roles and the efficiencies, the great strength is that you can take an airman and uh, a Marine Lance Corporal and a Petty Officer uh, and very professionalized senior NCOs uh, with a junior officer and senior officer cadre, and they can be immediately effective across uh, a 20 or 30 year career. Uh, and that is what we really need to do. So uh, hopefully that was on point. I feel like we may have just, I feel like Aaron may have just froze. Oh, if I, uh, hopefully you can hear me there. No, okay. I was, I actually wanted to come back to your, uh, your comment around defending the nation. I think we, we, uh, Admiral White, General Hawk, great comments about service culture, like the services or the, the, the forces that are fighting under the sort of planning and guidance of, of, of Cybercom. Um, but I, I love still talking about the defend the nation concept. A, it's one I can sort of admit now, five or four years later, I was wrong. Right? I should probably publicly apologize to Admiral White for like when I was in policy position, sort of beating him and the team up about why do we need to do all this planning with the private sector? Um, I think we've it's 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 sort of played out in the defend the nation mission that even though private sector manages, owns, operates, you know, 95, 97% of our critical infrastructure, that it's still essential for the cyber national mission force to have those points of partnership so that there is an understanding to better sort of defend forward and defend the nation from events of, of significance. And uh, I don't think sort of everybody in the department sort of had my mindset of no, let's completely separate. But I certainly probably had that had that wrong, and it's. I'm glad to see it has you know evolved um, in the past couple of years with closer partnerships between uh, critical industries, between the department and DHS and other uh, U.S. government agencies and, and departments that can really sort of understand and characterize the threat, and then um, in the time of crisis defend the nation from. Uh, a, a tax of significance. So public apology, Admiral White, near the former CNMF team. I had that one wrong for sure. Um, but it's great to see it, it, it evolve over time. And I love the new concept of uh, defend forward in, in policy. Yeah. So I think that brings up a really important point, um, especially since sometimes we use words that we think we all understand, but then um, especially for me sitting on the outside and I watch kind of the public response to, for example, US cyber strategy. And you know, I think quite often people are saying, well, what these words you're saying, I don't understand what they mean. So defend for it is one that um, I think has really struggled in the public narrative um, because it sounds a little disingenuous it sounds a little bit like y'all are doing offense and we're calling it defense. 
Um, and I'm not sure that that's exactly what is happening, um, but I do think that that's been one of the major critiques against the 2018 cyber strategy was that they introduced this concept of defend forward and then um, the public narrative um, has really struggled to understand what that is. So I'd be interested from my um, panelists, kind of what is your understanding? And I know actually um, Dr. Rovner was working in the, um, in the command as they were trying to figure out kind of how do you articulate this and operationalize this? So like, what is Defend Forward operationalized? Um, what is this concept? And why is it different than what we were doing in the 2015 strategy? Well, I mean, maybe I'll kick it off and turn it over to Dr. Rovner saying, I think in 2015, we we're way too passive around how we thought about that. I mean, there were some impediments on the policy side and our interagency partners. From a DOD perspective, we certainly wanted to be able to sort of better characterize that space between sort of our blue borders and networks and, and adversarial space and be able to understand the intents and prepare, prepare to fight. Um, it was just there was, we were pushing big boulders uphill policy wise. Uh, I think the, the pivot in concept to give the department a little more or maybe a lot more autonomy on how we think about like operating in that middle ground is uh, uh, to the layman sort of what we mean by, by defend forward. But Dr. Rovner, if you want to sort of jump in and give your characterization of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, at the most basic level, defend forward means defending off the DOD information networks, right? And, and it's a way of contrasting a, a, a very conservative uh, kind of retrenched defense against your networks versus the idea that in order to defend them effectively, well, you have to go collect intelligence on uh, off the Dota and off duty information networks and sometimes act to mitigate um, threats that you find, right? And, and so to, to, my, to my mind, that's the easiest explanation. Are you strictly sort of building a fortress and trying to, to raise higher and higher walls or are you, you know, sending out scouting parties to see if threats are developing and, and, and trying to mitigate them if you can? Now, I, that's how I think about it. I think Jackie is, is completely right that rhetorically, this is always going to, to, to raise hackles. And I think people have legitimate concerns about what this means because defend forward itself, it sounds odd. It sounds, um, it sounds less like defending and more like acting aggressively. Right? The other way to look at it is to think about it as a particularly um, energetic kind of counterintelligence program. Right? And from, from my background, I, I studied intelligence for a long time before I, I, I um, went into the command. Um, this looks pretty familiar. If you're in an environment where you're trying to figure out what's going on and, and threats are kind of nebulous and they're trying very hard to disguise themselves, well, if you really want a picture, you have to go out and you have to be more energetic in how you collect and, and what you do. And it's simply just a, a policy choice about how energetically you want to pursue that, that, um, that intelligence and that counterintelligence mission, right? So I think, again, there's two ways to think about it. Do you defend at home or do you expand defenses to do a better job? Or do you treat this or think of it like an intelligence problem and decide as a, as a policy choice to, to be more energetic? Um. So I have, I have a couple of thoughts, which I'm happy to share. And then Tim, uh, I suspect you could uh, correct the record a little bit. I think, um, I think first and foremost, it recognizes the persistent activity that any number of actors and adversaries, generally we would call them advanced persistent threats among others uh, and what they have been and are undertaking to do to impact counter or reduce US interests. And those of our friends, allies and partners, I think, uh, it is, it is not, uh, it is, I think the left post is peace, the right post is wartime. And I think this is just a simple recognition that there is a uninterrupted continuum uh, that connects the two. So I think that's important. I think the second thing is it acknowledges the pace and reach of cyberspace. Uh, and in a very sort of simple way, uh, we can't wait here. We have to be there. 
And I think that's just kind of a pragmatic reality. Uh, we benefit deeply from being so interconnected, uh, but we need to uh, just understand um, the obligations that we have as the Department of Defense to the nation uh, and fundamentally as critical infrastructure. Uh, Tim, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the other really key point is that, you know, from my perspective, is that as, as we built this force and you built this set of expertise inside of US Cyber Command, closely partnered with the National Security Agency, we also weren't able to realize the potential of that force. It was a force in waiting. And, and really then the, 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 uh, when the secretary asked us to be engaged, and I, I really look at in many ways the, the 2018 midterm elections as one of those critical points that took that force from a force in waiting to a force in action. And we were able to operationalize General Noxoni's strategy, which was persistent engagement. But the two segments of that are enable and act. And how much we can do as the Department of Defense to enable Homeland Security to, to, to protect critical infrastructure, to enable the FBI to, to understand threats from a foreign influence perspective, to be able to enable the State Department to have insights into adversary uh, advanced persistent threat activities that would allow them to consider demarche or partnerships with other nations. All of those things are a leveraging of the military instrument of power to be able to make the other elements of the executive branch even more successful. And, and that's, that I think is what we've been extremely proud of in the execution of persistent engagement is how our force in partnership with other elements of the executive branch, other combatant commands, and also with international partners can make it more difficult for adversaries to attack things that are of vital interest to us, while also being prepared to act either with offensive or defensive cyber, if that's what our nation asks us to do. And I think we found that there are some things with our force that particularly on the defensive side that have now enabled partnerships with industry that have been really uh, innovative and, and powerful. And one of those examples but when we were able to now take that defensive force and in partnership with state, deploy it to foreign networks, it allowed us to go see what the adversary was doing outside our borders, consistent with law and policy that we operate forward, defend forward outside of the United States. And we brought back that information, we're able to disclose it to industry so that then they could take that knowledge and stop the adversary use globally of their tools, their malware. And I think that's still part of the creativity that we're gonna to continue to see in, in the tradecraft development within US Cyber Command and all of, our, all of our components in partnership with the rest of the executive branch and the things that they're being asked to do. So we now have uh, a lot of really, really phenomenal questions. So I want to, um, to kind of pull on the, those last set of comments um, and ask about some of um, the relationships between DOD cyber and domestic cyber threats. So at the very beginning of this conversation, we started talking about defending the nation. Um, but in the kinetic or more conventional domains, there's a real geography to where the, the US military is defending the nation. Um, it's, you know, it's not that many places. Most of US military forces are um, aiming or looking at uh, adversaries that are outside of geographic borders. But the vast majority of cyber attacks were occurring against our critical infrastructure, which is domestic. And this is a bit of kind of a sticky place for the Department of Defense to be because we have not traditionally been built to deal with um, internal problems. Usually, I mean, that's been to our benefit historically. We have an extraordinary history of um, professionalization within the US military. Um, so cyber introduces new challenges. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about what the Department of Defense's role is in domestic cyber threats and kind of what are the lanes in the road? How do you determine what is appropriate and not appropriate for the DOD to be doing when it comes to defending cyber threats within the nation? Yeah, Aaron, you go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would just sort of bring it back to this is where I said I had it wrong, right? I mean, this... Uh, a, a characterization of what those threats are, right? I mean, uh, you know, the department has intelligence capabilities. Through those intelligence capabilities, there's an ability to uh, 
uh, assess malware threats that could be coming towards our critical infrastructure. There's processes by which you know, those uh, indications um, can be shared with the private sector. I know that's ongoing. Um, you've also, and again, not to, to get a little wonky on this, but you've, you've heard about the evolution of the, the vulnerabilities equity process, right? Like when you know, various parts of the US government identify or made aware of vulnerabilities in software that could impact sort of how um, the US and the broader economy does business. There's now a much more rigorous review of those equities that can be shared. I think that's sort of an evolution of how we're defending and, and leveraging capabilities inside the, the department for the, for the greater good. Um, but absolutely, uh, you know, I just, uh, again, we'll say that the, the further left that there's an awareness of, um, you know, how our critical infrastructure is structured, where there's opportunities for our CNMF or other cyber operations or cyber protection forces to, to partner with industry or via DHS or others, I think we should all sort of be in favor of that sort of knowledge transfer because there's a good insight of what we've seen adversaries capable of, uh, of doing. So leveraging that intel for the benefit of defending the country and sharing it with private sector partners, I think that's evolved a ton over the last 10 years. Um, probably a bit cliche to say, hey, we need improved information sharing, but we need improved information sharing. And I think that's, that's continuing to, to happen. Um, yeah, so a couple of thoughts on that, Jackie. Um, I think it's very, very, very important to understand, uh, I think, what we or you are asking when you say domestic cyber threats. Right? So th those will likely be interpreted as uh, you know, some sort of alarm words, uh, depending on where, where you are and what you're doing. So I would just say generally, in order for something to be, uh, in the context of the DOD, in my view, in order for something to become a domestic threat, I would characterize that it is launched against U.S. infrastructure in targets from inside the United States. And that is a concern. And there's a whole regimen of uh, law and protocol that governs how, how the DOD approaches that. That's sort of kind of observation number one. Uh, observation number two would be, in many measures, a lot of those uh, threat concerns or, or adversary capabilities, in order to come become a domestic matter, they have to begin in international space, right? They begin offshore and then they, they come here. And so that is the real value uh, that Aaron talks about and that General Hawk has mentioned about combination of uh, the intelligence insights, uh, which is also a DOD, not just an IC function and leverage that for purposes of defense and knowledge uh, and the, the vital importance for information sharing. My sense in terms of domestic space uh, is, you know, when we started this 10 or so years ago, um, it was very easy to look at the DOD and the IC as sort of um, the gold standard and for very good reason. What I have become impressed with over the last decade is to see how much industry uh, has gained insight, knowledge and expertise. And uh, whether it's the financial sector and the FSI SAC or the energy ISAC, uh, or others, right? Uh, they have some extraordinary capability. Uh, they have an awful lot of infrastructure. They've instrumented that. Uh, they're generating their own insights. And, and what we need to do better, uh, as Aaron pointed out, is figure out how to exchange and share that information uh, so that we have a knowledge advantage. Um, I do think uh, that the National Guard Bureau and what the Air Guard and Reserves, I think the Army and the Air Force and the Coast Guard will be much more familiar and comfortable with this uh, because of the Air Guard and Reserve culture that they have. You know, the Navy Reserve culture is really about supporting ships overseas. That's a, that's a little simplistic, but the fact that there's a mechanism with the Coast Guard to, uh, and state infrastructure and adjutants general uh, to understand Title 32 authorities. And I think that there's real opportunity uh, to take advantage of that. But I think it's also important to be very, very clear. Um, you know, the DOD uh, and the intelligence community are not authorized to do any sorts of surveillance activities inside the United States against Americans and U.S. persons, right? That is uh, prohibited. And uh, one of the things that I always took great comfort in 
uh, as a taker of an oath is that uh, we were very, very deliberate about, um, about observing that requirement and those constitutional protections. Uh, Tim, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think for us, you know, everything starts with our law, our policy and our values. And, and, and we're incredibly conscious uh, of each of those as we approach any operational activity. And, and as you can imagine, when we moved into the election security uh, role for the Department of Defense, that took a lot of time to make sure that we, we were doing the right activities consistent with what our authorities were. But also that then means, how do you then support the elements that are responsible for the protection of critical infrastructure? So we touched on a little bit earlier that, that TJ had started a pilot with DHS to work through one critical infrastructure segment. That became part of the law in 2019. So in the NDA 2019, it increased the Department, Department of Defense's authority to then do activities with DHS, now at a scale that allows us to bring weight and capacity in uh, underneath DHS. So we were, we're giving our, our capacities to, to DHS so that they can work in more critical infrastructure segments and help us make that synergy happen. That's an example of us thinking our way through, consistent with our law, consistent with our policies, consistent with things that from a Department of Defense perspective, we're comfortable doing so it's, that it is uh, inherent to what a Department of Defense mission is and done in the right way. And, and we are incredibly conscious of that in every activity that we're conducting. Can I just jump in on, on this though? I, I, I echo the, the, the comments about taking great care on how we do this. I think this is a really, really important point because um, I think this is something that we need to have a national conversation about. When we're talking about protecting an election, we're talking about protecting a fundamental uh, democratic process. And when we invite the military to take part in this, I think it's been done fine, but it could be done poorly in the future if we don't take care. And we don't be very, very um, honest about how we're doing this and forthright about how, how we're doing this. So what, what, when, I, when I hear um, infrastructure is one of these concepts that is prone to misuse because you can define infrastructure and critical infrastructure in a million ways. I think there used to be like 16 or 17 categories of critical infrastructure and the meaning of critical becomes um, pretty broad, right? So um, I, I look at the, I think that there's a long-term risk for not just CNMF, but for the military in general, which enjoys tremendous public support these days, in large part because it's perceived as apolitical, right? The military has stayed out of the fray and it's very professional and we like that and it's, and it's important. If you bring any component of the military closer and closer to a domestic political process, you run the risk of losing that, that, that protection, that barrier, that, that distance. So I, I think that this is, this is um, still an open question about how we move forward with this. The other thing that concerns me is that um, we have given uh, the military more and more responsibilities going back decades. Right? It's been a long time since the role of the military was simply to fight and win the nation's wars. The military is now involved in diplomacy and civil affairs and economic development and public diplomacy and now um, uh, election security and a, a raft of defend the nation um, jobs. And, and, and I worry about it getting stretched thin over time. I worry that we, we talk a lot about talent and personnel, which is part of the book as well. And the more that you give um, the command and the more you give various uh, uh, military elements new jobs, the more you um, exacerbate that personnel problem. Right? So I, I, I think that uh, um, we've done okay, I think so far in balancing these issues in, in the cyber world, but there's a real risk that will we'll become overstretched. I think it's a really important point. Um, and that's something that, um, especially in the next few years, if there are austerity years um, post pandemic, that will have to become like a really, really um, important question. Um, 
I want to get to something that the audience has asked a lot about, which is solar winds. Um, so what is the impact of something like solar winds on the Department of Defense? And then what should the Department of Defense do to kind of keep things like this from happening in the future or to respond to solar winds, if anything? This is like my seminars where like nobody. <laughs> I think it's because yeah. everybody had this. Is, let, let me actually jump in and I'm saying this you know, just as, you know, not as a, a U.S. government affiliate or anything like that. I mean, I think we need to look at solar winds for what it is. Now, not that it wasn't disruptive uh, in terms of its impact on U.S. companies, but it was an incredibly effective intelligence gathering operation, right? And what I worry about, um, if I were to put my policy hat back on, is that in the sort of reaction to solar winds, we somehow impede the ability of our military or intelligence professionals to do similar actions against our adversaries. So let me, let me just sort of state that up front is that uh, absent any open source, and I, I, you know, I'm not privy to any intelligence here outside of any sort of open source reporting that says that the particular actors here presumed to be Russians had any sort of destructive intent it appears to be, uh, again, a very successful and broad intelligence gathering operation. And I, I certainly hope that um, uh, our entities are hopefully doing the same thing, right, for intelligence gathering. Now, if I put my private sector hat on, of which I, you know, now I'm a, a, a CISO for a Fortune 50 company and I have to react to sort of supply chain disruption, right? And that supply chain can uh, sort of equally impact you know, U.S. government, right? We need to probably consider, um, you know, how there is uh, uh, sort of, you know, deeper insights into the sort of efficacy of, of how these various uh, uh, software products are used in, in critical services. Um, now, part of me said that's like maybe an intractable problem. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not smart enough uh, for how to solve that. But I think sort of some, uh, not that we want to layer accreditation on accreditation on accreditation of FedRAMP this and certification that, uh, but certainly a view um, into the third party risks that are present in our, our government and military systems and how we look at what software products or vendors are performing you know, critical services for the government is certainly a, a challenge, not just for DOD, but USG writ large post solar winds. Yeah, so Jack, I have a couple of thoughts on that. And I think they'll be very consistent with what Aaron said. Um, yeah, so I think uh, sort of job one, um, to view solar winds is not yet a was. Uh, solar winds is continuing, right? So public disclosure, the end of the second week of December. And I think we're still going to find out uh, more and more about it. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize that solar winds isn't just solar winds, right? There's a whole bunch of interconnected supply chain interactions um, that uh, have, have bound itself uh, and have been combined together uh, into what looks like uh, a pretty extensive and thoughtful campaign. And, uh, you know, my experience in thinking about campaigns, uh, having partnered with Tim uh, on some of them and observed him do some amazing campaign thinking and planning and execution um, is that uh, in the context of a, of a second week of December public acknowledgement, that campaign probably started a year or more to the left of that. And probably uh, whoever was the decider, uh, once attribution is final, um, you know, made that a, a, a good challenge for those operating forces to overcome. I think the second thing is there's probably a whole bunch of people uh, in the DOD that never heard of SolarWinds uh, as a company and as software and as supply chain, and they had no idea that they were bound up in some fashion uh, into something that they knew nothing about and how that whole supply chain software certification and updating works. Um, and so fundamentally, uh, I agree that um, it can't just be RMF and CMMC and FedRAMP, although that has to be a good baseline. 
uh, to promote transparency and some degree of accountability. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, I think it's about generating visibility. If you're going to be able to do anything, uh, you have to see it, you have to recognize it, and you have to do something with it. Uh, unfortunately, as one of you Navy guys here, uh, that looks like that John Boyd uh, OODA loop uh, Air Force uh, thing. And, you know, we just need to get that R uh, down to zero. So I have a, a, a lot of questions about solar winds. I don't have many answers. I, I think TJ is absolutely right that we, we don't know. It's just, this is ongoing and it's gonna be a while until we can figure this out. But I think one interesting question that we all could, could think about and, and certainly the audience too is, you know, what's the view from the intruder's perspective, right? Does, does, does the intruder see this as a great success because it was able to get such a broad scope using software supply chain as, an, as a vector and then being able to potentially collect from a lot of different private sector and public um, targets? On the other hand, does this maybe suggest a little bit of weakness? That you're not able to get really good accesses against really important targets but instead you tried this shotgun approach, which might get you some stuff after a long period of time, but also raises your risk of exposure. Right? It's more likely that you're gonna be discovered if you try to do these broad collection um, operations rather than something that's more targeted. And the other um, uh, issue from the, from the perspective of the intruder is what if they were able to just collect a bunch of meaningless stuff? What if they got lots and lots of noise and very little signal, right? I can imagine, I have no information on this, but I can imagine a situation in, in which the intruders, you know, maybe they did high fives for a little while and then they, they realized that they were stuck with, 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 with a lot of gibberish, right? And have been exposed and have given their targets uh, new ways of defending themselves because they've revealed um, uh, these new vulnerabilities, right? So I, I guess I would just encourage people to, to, to think about this as a two-sided problem, not just how were we hit so badly and what must we do, but think about the perspective from the other side um, and, and how they're, they're evolving um, in, their, in their reflections on this case. I'll just touch on a couple of things real quick, which is uh, one, I think all of us uh, that, that have worked with Ms. Ann Neuberger, who's the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Technology and who's the, the federal government's lead for this, we have immense confidence in, in, the, in the actions she'll take to understand it, think about the implications for how we build back our networks, and then what actions we should take as a nation. Just incredible confidence in, in, in what Ms. Neuberger uh, and her leadership role in doing that. I think what it really also starts to highlight for us is what does public-private partnership look like? And in terms of this, uh, to a nation state uh, coming at a, a, a small software company that has immense reach, and what are the implications for that from a national security perspective? And then I think what you've seen is the lead turn of what some of this will look like. Um, some, and, and when I look at it from the Department of Defense perspective, how General Oxoni has now created the cybersecurity directorate inside of NSA and the number of public advisories that have come out since the establishment of the cybersecurity directorate is an example of where, where can you see this going? And then what is the right mix between the federal government being able to support uh, a industry and, and, and also what, what does it look like in data coming back from industry uh, to the government. So I think that's going to continue to work its way through. We have to be aligned in our laws and our policy and how we do that. But I think you can see the formation of that need for public-private partnership in an environment where it's really not in any other domain where you see that direct of an adversary action against a private corporation and then what that means for us as a nation as we go forward. We are down to only a few more minutes left. So we have now entered the dreaded lightning round. This is when I um, summarize a lot of the really smart questions that have been coming from our audience, um, take some of mine that I've been saving for the time. And then I ask you questions that require tons and tons of nuance, but you need to answer really, really quickly. Um, so everyone goes off mute. <laughs> um, and uh, and we, we get the, to um, enjoy this part. Okay, so I'll start with an easy one. 
Cyber Pearl Harbor, useful analogy or not? Yes, it is, but it only goes so far. And the thing about all of these is Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor was unanticipated and whatever is next in big in cyberspace will be unanticipated as well. Pearl Harbor is an interesting analogy, but you have to get into the nuance of it. And the problem is that it's not, it doesn't encourage nuanced thinking. Agreed. Indifferent. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I <would. laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So uh, what's in a word, what's in a name matters. Um, and across the services, cyber is called different things. Uh, so you have to choose one of these words um, as your favorite kind of nomenclature for the site, whatever this cyber thing is. So you can choose cyber, you can choose information, or you can choose the electromagnetic spectrum. Your choice. 100% cyber. cyber. Information. Information. Oh, cyber. the Air Force goes with information. <laughs> I'm leading an information warfare organization, so yes. <laughs> this was always my biggest like cultural kind of like collision with the Navy was how broad their understanding of cyber was and how much they really, really wanted to call it information. Though to be honest, when you would talk to anyone, what they really, really just wanted to do was shoot cyber things off a ship. But that was just my experience with the Navy at the Naval War College. Okay. I'm, wait, I'm waiting for the cyber bombs question, right? Don't we drop <laughs> cyber bombs? <laughs> We've been dropping cyber bombs for 10 years. No, yeah. not really. Only within authorities and completely within campaigns. Okay. So there's a future of cyber, the future of cyber warfare. Is it O plans or task forces? Both. That, that's not a cop out. Combatant commanders build the O plans, task forces are organized that plan and execute those campaigns. You require both of them. Okay. And U.S. Cyber Command's global perspective to think about this from a, a from a global campaign perspective and how we apply our task forces and and where we've really grown is inside of our staffs and the ability to do that integration with multiple combatant commands simultaneously, with also times where Cyber Command is the supported command. Yeah, this is an area I was hoping we we'd have more time to talk about because I think it's it's probably where we've evolved the most, right? General Hawk at the time I was in the Pentagon, right? The first time we were doing sort of this task force concept in the counter ISIL fight, I'm assuming it's sort of light years advanced since then and how we've uh, integrated with the combatant commanders globally to, to fight better and provide cyber capabilities through uh, for other missions, not just point for point cyber stuff. This is my next military innovation piece. I think that the move towards task forces and the experimentation with task forces in cyberspace has implications across domains and is probably one of the, the largest operational innovations that's occurred when it comes to thinking about competition versus conflict. But now far too much nuance, we got, we got, we got thrown off. Okay, um, use of force. Is that a useful threshold? We often say um, uh, that cyber exists under a threshold of the use of force. Is that useful or not? Not at all. I think it's essential. I mean, again, this, this lightning round. We need hours to debate the, 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 these issues, Jackie. It's so unfair. I, I, I think that, 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 to be blunt about it, I think violence matters right? because violence unleashes um, things that are very difficult to control, and it creates a whole different uh, dynamic uh, kind of competition than things below the threshold of violence. Yes. So I, 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 I can't, I, I, I can't I understand that, it without it. Yeah. That's the one I use is violence. Yeah. Well, that I think your military level of armed conflict. So, so I think that's where I start. Is you know where what is the foundation within our law, and then how we've implemented that. Yeah, and I think your military practitioners as a profession of arms will do the utmost to, uh, as Tim pointed out, uh, law and values uh, and policy. So that's good. Okay. Is so it a use of force if I write my password in plain text and put it on a sticky on my computer and then someone uses that? Like, that's what I said. Sort of not at all for a threshold, in my opinion. So there are, um, in the history of kind of the thinking on military strategy, the domains have various um, thought leaders. So in air, you have LeMay, for example, maybe the Navy loves Mahan. Is there a LeMay or Mahan for cyber? Wow. 
I mean, I, again, so at someone that I look up to a ton, big thinker in cyber is, just went back into the White House and Dr. Michael Solmeyer, the day I walked in the Pentagon, he sort of increased my IQ in thinking around this a ton. Now he probably doesn't go back 10, 15 years on this, but I love uh, Solmeyer. So I, I think much of what we are doing today is born on the vision of, of General Keith Alexander and the team that worked for him and, and General Noxoni, TJ White, S.L. Davis, Jen Easterly, and the work that they did to, to really carve out, to take General Alexander's vision and then and then make it a reality. I mean, I think Josh Brokner stands, <laughs> there stands a very significant chance here. Giant, a titan, a titan. Read his chapter, it is good. <laughs> okay, I want to leave with a really, really important question, okay? So um, coming into the fall, hopefully football comes back in a big way. <laughs> Who's gonna win the Air Force Navy game? It's all Navy all the way. Uh, we are Penn State. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I, you went to Lehigh for heaven's sake, Tim, come on. Be proud of the engineers for God's sake. <laughs> Yeah, I went to Columbia. I had no football. Well, it exists, but not really. So I, I often um, you go use my service affiliation as my kind of uh, fall football um, experience. Okay, I want to thank you all. We've had far more questions than we had time to answer. Um, but I think what that highlights is how important this conversation is and how much it needs to continue. Um, and I want to thank you all for your time and your honesty and your willingness to take part in this. And then everybody, go ahead and download this book. We'll see you in a few weeks when we'll be talking about cyberspace and talent uh, with Raj Shah. Um, and uh, this fantastic um, behavioral scientist from Rand, um, Chaitra, she's been working on cyber talent in particular, and then you're stuck with me for another week. So we'll see you all in a few weeks. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, everybody.